he is a new creation. All things are passed away and all things are become new. Doesn't say all things shall pass away. He says all things are passed away. They are not going to pass away. They are passed away. So he says, and such were some of you. Because you are a new creation. Watch it. And such were some of you. But. <laughs> Look at it. But what? But what? Past tense, future tense, present tense. Ye are washed. But ye are sanctified. But ye are justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of our God. Oh, hallelujah. Thank you, Lord Jesus. See why we get excited about the Word of God? Thank you, Lord Jesus. I'm, think about it. When you're studying the Bible, you come across something like this. Nobody tells you things like this. Only Jesus does. Religion can tell you this. When you have only religion, all the time you carry, you carry the burden of condemnation. Always trying to please God. Oh, struggling to please Him. But when you arrive in the place of rest, your life becomes a pleasure to God. Hallelujah. He says, such were some of you. This is the way God sees you. Such were some of you. But ye are washed. Why does he say some? Because he mentions certain kinds of sins. And it's not everybody who committed such sins. You probably committed some other sins. You understand? That's why he says some of you. Because, for example, he says, um, um, fornicators, idolaters, adulterers, effeminate, thieves, covetous, drunkards, revilers, extortioners. What about liars? Didn't say anything about that. See? And that's just as bad, you know. Am I right? There's so many other things. And I know you're hoping that I don't mention yours. But remember, the Bible says, Ye are washed. Ye are sanctified. Ye are justified. That means declared not guilty, declared righteous. Amen. Okay, so that's what I... Go back to Revelation 1, not through yet. Revelation chapter 1, where we were. See, tonight I have you right where I want you. No going home tonight till I'm done. <laughs> no. So you just be with me. <laughs> so... We go back to verse 5, the latter part of verse 5, where we read, Unto him that loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood. Did you notice that? He loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood. And I said, that means I'm washed. The Bible says he washed us. And then we went to 1 Corinthians chapter 6 and verse 11 to notice that he calls us washed. He says, but ye are washed. Praise God. Now, after the word blood, the last word in verse 5, what do you have? A full stop or what? Are you sure? Full stop? Are you sure? What do you have? Good. That means the sentence is not over yet. So we can't stop in verse 5, but that's where many have stopped. Can we move on to verse 6? And what? And what? Oh, my cobra, dika, satra. Thank you, Lord Jesus. This is just marvelous. The glory of God is in this place. Thank you, Lord Jesus. And hath made us. Look at it. It's right there. And hath made us. 
Does it say, and shall make us? Come on. What does it say? And hath made us. What? Kings and unto who? And his to him be what? Glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. <laughs> Hallelujah. You know, sometimes people don't understand why we pray the way we pray sometimes. All the time they hear say, I command you to come out. Be healed. They say, who, who does he think he is commanding like that? They expect you to say, oh God, please stretch forth your hand right now and heal this precious soul. And help him live a normal life again, oh God. We beg of you in Christ's name. They're not going to get healed that way. The Bible never said in any place that we should pray to God to heal the sick. He said to us, heal the sick. Mm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. In Acts the third chapter, you studied for yourself. Peter and John at the gate of the temple called Beautiful. They met a man who was important in his feet, never walked from birth. What did Peter say? That's the first pope, you remember? What did he say? He said to the man, silver and gold have I none, but such as I have, give I thee. Did he say, silver and gold have I none? But such as I have, I shall use to pray. Did he say, silver and gold, the Lord doesn't have. But such as he has, he giveth thee. He said, silver and gold have I not. And that's because he didn't have any at the time. You notice, the Bible says he was with John. And he didn't say, silver and gold have we none. He said, have I none. Because he didn't know if John had something. Yep. Yep. John probably had something. So he said, silver and gold have I none. He started by saying, look on us. So he knew John was with him. He said, look on us. Read it for yourself. Meaning, give us. John and me. Give us your attention. Then he said, Silver and gold have I none. But such as I have, give I thee. Then he said, in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up! <laughs> Why? The man had found out something. He had made us kings. The Bible says, where the word of a king is, there is power. Hallelujah. In Romans chapter 5 and verse 17, the Bible says, They which receive abundance of grace and of the gift of righteousness shall reign in life. They shall reign in life. That's the reason I can never be poor in my life. He says, They which receive abundance of grace and of the gift of righteousness. The gift of righteousness, that's the nature of God. He says, they shall reign in life. Another translation says, they shall reign as kings in the realm of life. They shall reign. That means they have the dominion. That means they walk in this world with the spirit of dominion. Next time when you go in for your contract, as you enter that office, you breathe it and say, I walk into this office in the name of Jesus by the spirit of dominion. When you walk in by the spirit of dominion, you have everybody there arrested. <laughs> walk in that light next time, you'll be amazed. As they open the door for you, you just say it under your voice. You don't have to say it out, otherwise they'll think you've gone nuts. 
You say, I walk in with the spirit of dominion. Come, I see Gradiska. You, you, you'd be in charge. <laughs> Thank you, Lord Jesus. You've got to use what you have. Use it. He hath made us kings. Now, he says, unto him that loved us and washed us. So I'm right to say, I'm loved and washed. Correct? And hath made us kings. That means, in the same vein, following the same sentence, I can also say, I'm a king. I am not going to be a king. I'm already a king. Come on. Come on. Come on. You get it? If you're a king, you're going to reject stroke tonight. How long does it take to be a king in the realm of life? I tell you. How long does it take to be made the righteousness of God? How long does it take to please God? How long does it take for God to lift you up? Can I tell you how long it takes? As long as it takes you to say yes. Anybody's got the living Bible here? Can I have a living Bible? Whose Bible is living here? Come on. Let me just read something to you. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's something more than good. Something more than good. The Spirit of God in the hearts of men is something more than good. Let me read this to you. Come, let's talk this over, says the Lord. I like it. See why I love the Living Bible? It's so fresh. You can find that in King James. King James says, Thee, thou. <laughs> now this is fresh. He says, Come, let's talk this over. Over, says the Lord. Can you imagine what an invitation? And then in the next verse says, If you will only let me help you. You're wondering, where is he reading? I'll tell you. When I'm through, you've got to get the living Bible. And the publishers have to pay me for this advertisement. <laughs> Listen to it. If you will only let me help you. If you will only obey me. What obedience to the Lord? No. He says, let me help you. Let me. Then I will make you rich. I, are you shocked that that's in the Bible? He says, I will make you. See, what did Jesus say? Follow me and I will make you fishers of men. Is that right? Anything. God doesn't want you struggling in your life. Whether to be a fisher of men or whether to anything. He says, let me help you. The Bible says he lifted up the beggar from the dung hill. You remember that? He wants to help you. The Bible says the eyes of the Lord run to and fro upon the earth to show himself strong. God is looking out, wanting to help somebody. You realize that's the kind of God he is? You say, what about me, God? I need help. All the help I can get right now. Listen, he's right there. He's looking out for somebody who's calling. Whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Can I tell you more? Show you what more? You've been calling. I tell you what's the next step. He said, Well, I called and God didn't do nothing. No. There's a difference between the Old Testament and the New Testament. In the Old Testament, you yelled out, God help me. 
and then you waited until he did something. In the New Testament, you don't wait. I said you don't wait. That's the meaning of the gospel. Hello, good news. You don't have to wait. That's the meaning of gospel. When he said go and preach the gospel, that's what he told us to preach. Tell them they don't have to wait. You say, how do you know? When you read for yourself in the 14th chapter, book of Acts, read from the 7th verse right the way, all the way to the 9th verse, you find Paul preaching at a city called Lystra. There's an important man sitting on the ground, never walked from birth. And Paul is preaching. The Bible says, as he looked at the man, he perceived that the man had faith to be healed. That means the man was listening to his message and believing it. Because faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. What did he tell the man? He said, pray? No. The man was impotent, never walked from birth. Paul didn't pray. Because he was preaching the gospel. What is the gospel? The good news of Christ's salvation. What does it take to be saved? The Bible says the word of salvation is nigh thee. It is even in thy mouth. That if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, believing in thine heart that God had raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. That's all. He says the word that saves you is already in your mouth. He says, speak it forth. What did Paul say to the man? Pray loud for God to hear you and he'll save you. No. Hold on until God sees fit to heal you. No. Paul said, get up. That was all. <laughs> he said, get up. The Bible says, the man leaped and walked. He said, get up. Doesn't matter where you are tonight and what you're suffering from. When you hear, get up tonight. I tell you, I feel the anointing tonight on this platform. It's the same anointing that Paul felt, I'm telling you. The same anointing that Peter knew. If he were here tonight, if Paul came up here tonight, he would tell you, this is it. If John came up here tonight, he would tell you, this is what I felt. Peter will tell you, this is what I felt that day at the gate of the temple called Beautiful. The Bible says Elijah was a man of like passions as we are. He prayed earnestly that there should be no rain and there was no rain for three and a half years. The Bible says he was just like the rest of us. Then he prayed again and there was rain. What do you think they were like? They were like us. But they responded to the anointing of God's spirit. They responded to the anointing. And that's what I'm telling you tonight. Learn to respond to that anointing. When you receive the Holy Spirit. You're like David. At that time that you received the Holy Spirit. He says, children, I write unto you. Because you have overcome the wicked one. You have that devil is defeated and that first stage of the anointing what did what did David do he destroyed Goliath and yet Israel had not known him he just came out a young man he said who's that big mouth you remember when you received the Holy Ghost what you were like you were bold. Am I right? You were bold. I mean, you just received the Holy Ghost and the whole world looks small to you. If that didn't happen, you didn't receive the real Holy Ghost. I mean, somebody, yeah, do I have the Holy Ghost? How can you be asking if you have the Holy Ghost? If you have the Holy Ghost, you're going to go around saying, guess what I got? Because you would know. He destroyed Goliath. 
When you receive the Holy Ghost, you learn to talk big. When you hear people talking small, they haven't received the Holy Ghost. You learn to talk big. He came there, he says, who's that big mouth? And he's, he's a little boy, not qualified for the war front. He wasn't qualified for the army. 17 years old. They only sent him to go and give his brother something. And he heard Goliath terrorizing Israel. Even King Saul felt small that day. And David heard somebody talking. Everybody else was quiet. He said, who's that? He said, shut up. He said, I just want to know. He said, that's Goliath of God. He said, whoa, whoa. Why don't you all fix him? Somebody said, are you crazy? He said, Yo, what, why are you all hiding? His eldest brother said, get home now. Get home, quick. Who did you leave the, the few sheep at home for? <laughs> they said, who did you leave the sheep for? You're in charge of the goats and the sheep at home. Go back. He said, I haven't done anything wrong. I just want to know why that guy is talking like that. Can't you deal with him? He said, I can, I, he said, I can control that guy. <laughs> he said, what's wrong with you? He said, man, listen. You know what happened to him? When the Holy Spirit came upon David, and he went back to taking care of his father's sheep, one day, a lion came out against him and picked one of the keys. He charged after the lion. Before the Holy Ghost came upon him, he would have run away from the lion. But when the Holy Ghost came, brother, oh man, I feel that thing right now. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Oh, glory. Oh, glory. He charged after the lion. A bear came. He went after the bear. He said, I killed a lion and I killed a bear. He said, that means the big mouth will be like one of them. They said, did you kill a lion? He said, yep. Man, oh mine. Somebody said, let the king hear this. A young guy who kills a lion. And they took him straight to Saul. Saul was expecting somebody huge. They said, there's a young guy out here. He says he's killed a lion and he's killed a bear before. Saul said, what? A lion? With his bare hands or what? He said, he, he, said he tore the lion apart. He said, I caught the lion by his beards. Did you read what he said? David said, he said, I went after the lion and I caught him by his beards. He didn't say I held him by the tail. He said, I caught him. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Oh, thank you, Lord Jesus. Bring him back. Oh, thank you, Lord Jesus. Brother, it was face to face. He said, I cut him by his beard and I slew him. That's what the anointing does. So Saul said, get him. When they brought him, he was a little boy. And you know, Saul was head and shoulders above everybody else in Israel. When he saw David, the Bible says, he looked at David, he said, oh boy, handsome young man. How's your daddy? How's mommy? Uh... Are you sure this is the guy? They said, yeah. <laughs> Did you actually kill a lion? Have you ever seen a lion? He said, yes, sir. I killed one. Caught him by his beard. Slew him. And uh, a bear? Yes, sir. I killed him. Face to face, I killed him. Was he sick? No, sir. <laughs> he came to take one of the lambs. And when he took one of the lambs, I went after him. You went after him. Hmm. Yes, sir. Actually, we don't have much time, sir. That guy out there, someone has to take him. He said, I want to do it. The Bible says Saul looked at him and smiled and said, that man, he said, you are only a youth, but he has been a man of war from his youth. David said, I can fix him. All right. Saul said, may the Lord be with you. And took his armor and put it on David. 
And David went, he said, sir, this is too heavy for me. Can I take them off? Take them off? That guy is fully dressed. Look at his armor. Sir, I can't go with this. So what are you going to wear? Watch, sir. Took everything off and dropped the sword and dropped the shield. Eliab, the, his eldest brother, began to pray. He was thinking what he's going to tell daddy at home. Because this boy ain't coming back. <laughs> Goliath is going to have him for lunch. <laughs> but David, David went outside. When he got outside, they said, what's he doing? They saw him looking for stones. He picked one. When he picked one, he said, how many giants are there? They said, uh, Goliath has four brothers. He said, I need four more stones. And he picked five smooth stones. Brother, I said, when you receive the Holy Ghost, the first thing is, you learn to talk big. Fear leaves. And Saul announced, Yeah, O Israel! We have a representative now. As he comes out, you can go ahead and hail him. Let's cheer him up to victory. And they all, they all shouted until David came out. When David came out, ooh, ooh. Why? He was a little boy. And David came out. And Goliath said, Where is your champion? And David stepped out. The Bible says the Goliath looked at him and disdained him, for he was but a youth. He looked at him. Oh. Meanwhile, David was like this. The Bible says there was no sword in David's hand. Why he was doing this? Goliath said, am I a dog? You're coming out against me with a stone. Am I a dog? Look here, what's happening here? He was offended. But David said, you come out against me with a sword, with a shield, with a spear. But I come against you in the name of the Lord of hosts. I said, you got to learn to talk big. He said to Goliath, he said, today, God will give you into my hands. He said, I'll cut your head off of your head. And there was no sword in his hand. He said, I'll cut your head off of your head. And I'll give your carcass. He didn't stop there. He said, and the carcasses of the host of the Philistines to the birds of the air and the whole world shall know this day there is a God in Israel. <laughs> Hallelujah. He said, today, the Bible says, oh my, when Goliath took a step against David, just one step, David charged at him. Oh, glory. Hallelujah. No, he didn't, he didn't do that. No, no, no. He wasn't moving backward. He was, I'll kill you today. I'll kill you today. The Bible says he went forward against him. Hallelujah. Your act of faith, your expression of faith activates the power of God. He was anointed in the midst of his brethren. That anointing you received in your life is a devil chaser. That anointing you received in your life, the first day you received the Holy Ghost, that anointing is a devil killer, is a giant killer. Are you hearing me? There's something inside you, hallelujah, that knows no fear.
you are a victor. Can you say amen? amen? You're going to learn to yield to the anointing of God's Spirit. Yield yourself to the sway of God's Spirit. Yield yourself. The next time we find David, he's anointed. Again, this is the second anointing. Some of you have moved from the first stage of the anointing. You're now in the second stage of the anointing. How do you know the second stage of the anointing? By now, you have become persona non grata. Saul is after you. And even though the man Saul was dead, the Bible tells us there was a long war between the house of Saul and the house of David. When you are anointed in Hebron, that's what happens. He was anointed in Hebron over Judah. When that second level of the anointing is on your life, you find yourself in Hebron. Where is Hebron? Caleb said, give me this mountain. At this point of your life, something new is happening. This is the level where you begin healing the sick and casting out devils. Why? Because at that level, that second anointing, you discover Jabesh Gilead. And you understand the balm of Gilead. And of course, there will be rebellion in Gilead because the devils will stand against you. But you are more than a conqueror. <laughs> At that time of your life, you will find those, even though they know that you are anointed, you are chosen of God, they will say no to you. The Bible tells us that Abner knew that David was chosen of God to be king, yet he stayed in the house of Saul and fought against David. The Bible tells us that the elders of Israel knew that David was chosen of God to be their shepherd, but they stayed in the house of Saul and fought against David. Scriptures declare that they knew. Why did they do it? Because they were of the flesh. The flesh cannot resist the devil. The flesh will move along with the devil. The flesh will understand that this thing is not right and yet you'll go ahead and do it. You find yourself at war with the flesh. First, your own flesh, that means your own senses. Second, men of the senses will rise against you. That's the second level of the anointing. You're anointed at Hebron over Judah. Because of that anointing, they'll go after you. And you have the balm of Gilead. Are you hearing me? I said some of you are there now. Some of you are there now. You are facing. Opposition. But you have to face that opposition. It has to come. Because the flesh will not accept you. They will not accept you. They will say no. But when you win, because if you notice, after that second anointing, and Abner came out against David, David did not fight Abner. Ishbosheth came out against David, David did not fight Ishbosheth. Because with that second anointing, you are being taught how to walk in love. You must walk in love, you must keep a vision. Stay in it. He walked in love. For the Bible tells us when Abner came to see David, even though he was his enemy, David talked with him in peace and let him go in peace. And Joab was angry. He said, you let that man come in here and live in peace? You ought to have killed him. David said, no. You don't do that. Let him go. But Joab went ahead and killed him. And when David heard that Abner was dead, 
He cried. He lamented over Abner. And all of Judah and Israel knew that David never wanted Abner dead. Even though he was his enemy. Ishbosheth was killed. When David heard it, the men who killed him came to David and they said, Your enemy is dead. We've killed him. He said, You killed that righteous man? He called Ishbosheth a righteous man. Even though he was a wicked man. But he called him a righteous man. Why? Because he was chosen that way. And he was the son of the king. And David said, You too, you must die for killing Ishbosheth. And they killed him. And everyone knew that David's heart toward Ishbosheth was of peace. He walked in love. When you are in that second level of the anointing, and you have been anointed in Hebron over Judah, what do you do? You walk in what? Love. You don't repay your enemies. The moment you finish that and succeed in it, walking in love, and your enemies fall flat on their backs before you, the heir that of Israel will come back. Can you say amen? That is the third level of the anointing. That third level of the anointing, you get there by walking in love from the second level. Matter of time, they come, they say, we know. We knew God's word all the time. We know that you're the one chosen. And they said, David, reign over all Israel. And he reigned over all Israel. Are you hearing me? Some of you are in that third level of the anointing in your life. Are you there? God only knows. But if you're there, you don't stop there. For after he became king over Israel, the Bible says one day, it dawned on David that he was king. It dawned on him. Has it dawned on you? Has it become a reality? Are you aware? If you are aware, there's something more you must do. That's the revelation by the anointing. Can you say amen? amen? The anointing of God's spirit teaches you. So child of God, you cannot move by the flesh. You cannot move by your mind. Your mind will not help you. It will not. It takes the anointing of the spirit. Now that you're born again, you are no longer what you used to be. You are not an ordinary person. If you're going to move from one level to another, it will be by the Spirit of the living God. You will not journey on your own. The Bible says, when the children of Israel moved out of Egypt, when the cloud moved, they moved. When the cloud stopped, they stopped. Why would you move ahead of the cloud? To move ahead of the cloud is to walk out of God's protection for your life. Only move when the cloud moves. Only take your step when the anointing moves. Are you hearing me? The anointing of God's spirit. He says, saviors shall come. The Mount, Mount Zion. And you are that savior today. God is raising you as a savior. There's something God wants to do with you in your office. There's something God wants to do with you in your family. There's something God wants to do with you in your neighborhood. There's something God wants to do with you among your friends. There's something that the Spirit of God wants to do with you. Let me tell you something. Earlier on tonight, you were watching a tape. A lady who was healed in Port Harcourt, who couldn't walk. She was so sick. And they carried her to that crusade ground. You remember her? Now, she made a statement. And just tonight, I realized how powerful that statement was. She said during her testimony, that she was going to tell her story around the world. That night, as I listened to her, 
I thought, dear God, does she know what she's saying? How is she going to do that? She's not even, even, even a preacher. How is she going to do that? She's going to tell her story around the world. That's what she said. Tonight, the Spirit of God just opened my eyes to see how real her statement was. She was in a bar. I didn't know she was there. I watched her testimony for the first time tonight as you were watching it. She gave that testimony while she was in her purple dress. She, she gave that testimony at Abba. That's about uh, more than two years now since she got healed. About two years. A little over two years since she got healed. And that episode has been made and it's going around the world. I, I don't know if you got that. <laughs> that tape, that testimony she gave, how was it that she came to Abba? We didn't invite her. I don't know how she did it. She came there. They saw her and she testified. And they got that testimony together. And now her testimony is going around the world. Has she not fulfilled what she said? And she doesn't even know it. I said, if the anointing of God's spirit touches your life, don't wonder how. The day is going to come when Jesus comes back. And there are going to be people who will say to that dear woman, you led me to Christ. And that one is from Canada. And the other one is from Germany. And the other one from Japan. And she'll say, how? And they would say, we listened to your testimony. See what God does? You don't even know. And yet the Spirit of God is doing something. Let me tell you, when God tells you something, believe it. You may not know how. You may not know when. But He'll do it. you fulfill his word in your life it is not by might it is not by power but by my spirit saith the Lord by my spirit saith the Lord by my spirit saith the Lord you you're looking at me now but the anointing of God's spirit is going to carry you from here Your human mind will not understand it. You can figure it out. Just yield yourself to the sway of God's spirit. When the spirit of God moves you to pray. And tells you to pray. Go ahead and pray. That's the way to yield to the anointing of God's spirit. There are going to be times that the anointing of God's spirit will command you to pray. Don't say what for. What should I pray about? Just go ahead. Bow your knees and begin to pray. He will speak words through you. He will tell you to study the word. Go ahead. Study the word. Let him guide you. Let that anointing change your life. Yield yourself to it. And let God use you to touch lives around the world. I was told someone made a call at Ibado. After watching a, a program that we aired on Atmosphere for Miracles. And this lady said, because of someone that she saw on that particular tape. She believed. She says she had been watching our programs. But when she saw that man. She said this must be real. And she made a call. And went straight to the church. Now that one doesn't know. That by his simple. See. Just a word from the Holy Ghost can touch someone's life. Brothers and sisters, let me tell you, when we meet with Jesus, it's not going to be all the things that you can remember that you did by yourself that will matter. It will be the things that he put on record. The ones he put on record. Are you hearing me? So live your life according to the anointing. Live your life according to the anointing. When the Spirit of God is moving on your life, don't suppress it. 
if you don't know what is about to happen. Don't suppress it. When it starts moving inside you, boiling inside you, making you speak in other tongues, you may not shout, begin to speak. Right under your voice, but let it go out. You may be establishing things in the realm of the Spirit. Some of you, you need your life put together again. You've been living your life this way and that way. You need him to re-coordinate your life. Because you've gone far. Now you're hearing a voice behind you saying, Stop. Stop. Turn around. This is the way. You're hearing now. You're hearing now. There's a sweet, sweet spirit in this place, and I know it is the spirit of the Lord. Come on, sing it with me. There's a sweet expression on each face, and I know the feel the presence. Oh, 